Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Pote. Today, we're talking about the three things that Anthony... Why am I doing this in the third person? Today, we're talking about the three things Anthony... I did it again, third person. We're not third person. This is one person. Today, I'm talking about the three things that excite me the most. Number one, the halal guy recognized me after 13 months away. Number two, I sat at a bar for the first time in so long. And number three, live comedy is back. I'm Anthony Ladon, and this is Pote Podcast. What is happening? How the heck are you? It's good to see you. Or hear you. Well, no, actually, it's good for you to hear me. I think, I don't, is there a nice way to say that? I don't know. You know what I mean. It's good to see you, hear you. I'm glad that you're there. Whatever the appropriate way to voice some sort of appreciation for your being present, even if you're not. You may not be, because Lord knows I'm long gone by the time you're listening to this. I mean, not not like a, I'm not going to be long gone and like the, this is my last one ever and sayonara life. It's not, it's not it. But, uh, you know, I'm not there with you, I think is what I'm trying to say. But you know that. You do, don't you? Right? That's kind of the magic of this whole thing, right? Is I don't have to be there for you to, for me to entertain you. For me to uh, to talk at you, I don't. That's the best part about this. I, I'm here. I'm here at home. I'm not there with you. Not that I don't want to be. I'm sure you're in a very nice situation slash car slash waiting room, waiting to get something lanced. And as much as I would love to be there with you, holding your hand while they lance it, I don't have to be. I can be here, and I love that. So. Anyway, so glad that you're here. Welcome. I am so happy, and I'm going to tell you why. That wasn't just like a non sequitur random wind up of, I'm so happy. Anyway, let me tell you about this other thing that's really pissing me off. It's not that. Did you think it was that? That'd be weird, right? If you thought, oh, here's one of Anthony's, one of the old pot podcast, I'm so happy non sequiturs. I'm happy about this thing. And then I end up talking about something that drives me nuts. So anyway, here's the thing that's been driving me nuts. No, I am so happy. Two things. Two, I, don't, I don't know why I'm doing two in the shape of an L. When did we start counting with our thumbs, Anthony? It's not a fa- Just two. It's the peace sign or the reverse peace sign. Just don't. Why am I doing my thumb? What happened to me? Did I bump my head? Yeah. COVID changes you. Before I went in, I love I love all these stories too of like, oh, COVID changed everything. Coming to a theater near you. COVID changes. And then it's like the Counting Crows changes version of David Bowie's changes. <laughs> Virus changes you. Or something, I don't know. That, that's the melody, right? Whatever. But yeah, it's not one of those. Like before I went into COVID, I was just counting with my fingers. And after coming out, I'm counting with my thumbs. Boy, this is super weird, right? No, it's not that. So two, what was I talking about? Two things, two things that have got me so happy. Number one, I sat at a bar. This is big news for me in New York. My wife and I went to our favorite restaurant, to our favorite bar. Well, it's the only bar within the restaurant. And we sat at the bar. This was the first time we had done that since February of 2020. And I know wherever you're listening to this, you might have been to a bar, you might have been seated at a bar. So this might not be big news to you. But in New York, this is like, it's a big deal for New York. Number one, because we haven't had it. But number two, and the main reason why, is because part of the nice thing about New York and the city is that, like, it's annoying. Everything about the city is annoying, and you want to get away from the annoyance, so you go to a bar. You don't have to get hammered. You just go in and grab a drink to kill some time. If you're in between work meetings, you know, throw back a couple martinis. That's the whole point. That's why they're there. They're quieter. They tend to be. You know, or they could be casual. Go to an Irish bar and have a pint or whatever in between things. That's the, that's the whole, that's the nice thing about bars in New York is that you go there to get away from everything else. All the people, all the weirdos, all the tourists, all the locals in New York. You just get away from them and you can retreat 
to a bar. Where I know in, in other, I, this isn't unique to New York, but, but it is kind of the different thing. Like in other cities, it's not as annoying. Like no other city I think is as annoying as New York. And you, I say that with love. If you're a listener to this podcast, you know I love everything about this city. Most of all, how annoyed I get at everything, everywhere, all the time. Because those little annoyances force me to become a better person. Now that weed's legalized, it smells like losers everywhere in the city. And I have to be okay with that. So now I med- you know, I'm trying to meditate that away, trying to be okay with it. I don't care if people smoke pot, but just don't do it around other people. Like uh, that's, the, you know, you're like cigarette smoke is bad enough. It's not that bad. You know, it's like, okay, it's smoke. But like weed just smells like, it smells like a dying animal. And, you know, that's very fun. A super fun dying animal for some people. But uh, it, why do it out walking around? The, the annoying thing is, the, actually the only real bad part about that whole thing is that now when I'm in a bar with an open door or window, the smoke comes right in. So now I just get to smell you having a good time out there. Not excelling at life. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, that's the whole thing. That's why I love sitting at a bar in New York. And I, I, okay, so where was I going with this? I know New York is, it's not that unique in this, but other cities aren't that annoying. Seattle, the bars only exist in Seattle in the neighborhoods, you know, cause it's like, oh, where are we going out tonight? And you go to a bar or something or in the city itself, which is a tiny little downtown part. It's just there for work. People having a couple drinks afterwards which actually makes it even way better during the day for the bars that are open because then you can get a cocktail and there's nobody else there. And it's amazing. Things may have changed. My, my data points here are probably 10 years out of date. So, okay. San Francisco, same way. That city's a little more annoying than Seattle. Again, in a good way, but uh, it's still not that annoying. There's not, it's not like this, you don't have this super tight packed corridor, dense, population of annoyances all in one place and time in the city you do have that and that the reason why bars are sacred spaces hallowed ground in my mind is because they're retreats it's it's basically like it's like going back to base you know what would the game is it all the ollie oxen free or whatever when you're a kid and you're like no you can't touch me i'm good i'm at base that's what a bar is to me What's the, what's the name of the game? Does anybody know? Send me an email at potcast at gmail.com and tell me, please, what that stupid childhood game is that I can't remember but had so much fun playing. You know, it's like you can run around and do the, I don't know what the, even the goal is. Kick the can? No, that's not it. But there's a game where you can, like, you're at base and they can't do anything to you. That's what a bar is to me. You can't can't touch me. I mean, I'm, this is safe space, hallowed ground. You probably, if you can't come in, you're not going to want to come in here because you have to spend a little bit of money in order to belong. And you're being annoying. You can be annoying on the street, but it's a little tougher to be annoying in a bar because you have to spend, you know, if you want a beer, it's whatever, New York prices, 15 bucks a pint. No, I had a cheap beer the other day, yesterday and the day before for $8 for a pint. That was uh, very excited about that. But anyway, that's, uh, that's why bars, I'm getting so excited about this. That's why I'm super excited for bars to be coming back and seated at the bar. It's not the same sitting in a restaurant because the this, this stupid rule about having to order food, that was the most inane, inane, not two ends. Wait, is it two ends? No, it's one end. That was the dumbest rule I think I've ever heard a politician make is to, you have to order food. What's the point? What is the point? That's a stupid idea. And you know what? I hope you go down politically for that. Uh, <laughs> this is, I'm very upset about that, but the, I liked going to, to a bar, ordering a drink and killing time. That's why you go to a bar. You can chat with other people. Cause there are other people there who are also killing time. It's like being part of a temporary club. That's the most beautiful. That's what a bar is to me in New York. It's a temporary club where kind of you self-select in people who want to be part of this. You have an Irish bar type of person, you know, casual pub. You've got like a steakhousey bar vibe. That's a different, you have the crack craft cocktail kind of speakeasy vibe ish people. And it's like a small, it's a, it's a temporary club. 
And the price of joining is the price of cocktails and tip. That's it. And I, but I didn't want to order food. Like when I'm just escaping, walking around the city, I don't need, I don't want to order food. I'm not hungry. I'm just ordering this drink so I can sit here and have a, a nice relax. So I can relax because everything out there is super annoying. This is my own little, this is my safe space. I'll spend whatever, 12 bucks for a cheap drink. God, I'm so happy about this. Nice glass of wine. Just, just relax. And it's nice. It's, uh, and it's back. So anyway, this story, where was I going with this? Oh yeah. Lauren and I went out to our, one of our favorite restaurants, sat at the bar and we, we actually did have food there because that's, you know, because that was like, all right, let's go out and actually get a bite to eat and we want to get outside of our home. That's the other use case for a bar. There's numerous, but in, it's not only just a retreat from the annoyances of the city. It's also uh, just a quick bite. Like, I don't want to sit down at a table. Sitting down at a table is like a commitment to me. I don't want to, I don't know if I'm going to be here for the whole meal. I might walk out halfway through, but at a bar, you can. Hey, let me close up. Bam, done. You have immediate access to the server. It's the bartender. He has nowhere to go. He's locked in. He's a captive audience for you. And that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Hey, close out. Just give him a quick wave. Boop. Done. In and out real fast. Or if you want to sit and linger, that's fine too. That's what we did. We had a meal and it was, it was glorious. Had a meal, a couple glasses of wine. Uh, and I could not, I think I wept at the bar. Incidentally, I wasn't the only person. There was a couple people weeping at the bar. They had had, they'd been there all day. So, uh, then they probably forgot to take some pills or something, but, uh, yeah, they, uh, I wasn't the only guy weeping. It was great. It was, Lauren was embarrassed. Uh, she sat three seats away. There were several stools between us, but you know, that's fine. I'll take it. So yeah, bars are back. I, oh man, that's the, that's, and now, oh, and by the way, in case anybody is wondering, I know everybody's wondering, the food restriction is gone. They rescinded that stupid rule slash law. And I couldn't, oh God, I couldn't be happier. I was ordering fries just to sit down. And now I don't have to do that. And I would just leave them. They were good fries. So, I mean, I ate some of them, but that was, I'm like, what's the cheapest thing on the menu? And usually it's fries, which is fine. Cause they're, that's not bad, but I don't, what you're, oh, that's how out of touch politicians are. It's like, Hey, uh, yeah, we just to make sure everybody stays safe. We want to ban bars. Okay. You know, fine. If that's, I get it. If, if you think that's going to help, you know, stop the spread early on, I get it. Uh, cause that's, you know, you sit and linger and mingle with people. They're standing and you can't catch it if you're sitting at a table, obviously. So you have to stand and that's, that's the bad one. Or you, when you do stand, that's bad. So let's limit bars, but then to require people to order food, you know, for like any sort of drinking. Cause a lot of us wanted to just go and do our bar activity at a table while we couldn't do bars. So it's like, I'd like a glass of wine. Well, you have to order food. Well, then I'm leaving. And uh, then there was no place to go. So then I was just, I was then be, I was then the annoying one on the street. I became an annoyance to somebody else. Oh God. Just the feeling, just when you're walking around, you can go anywhere in the city, walk around. And there's, if you stopped and looked anywhere, anywhere in the city. And when I say city, I mean Manhattan. I don't count, but the Bronx isn't the city. That's, it's technically part of New York city, but it's not, it's a whole other world. So is the Queens and Brooklyn. Brooklyn, those don't even count. I know they think they count, but it's not, it's not really, you know, if you're outside of the Northeast, yeah, you could tell people you live in the city, but you're not in the city. The Manhattan is the city in my mind, which is right. Cause it's my podcast, but yeah, it, it's, well, why did I go off on that slight tangent about the city and the, I just, I was just getting something off my chest about how those, the other boroughs can't claim they're not part of the city. No, that's an exclusive club. It's just Manhattan. You don't count Staten Island. That's a, that's a, Staten Island totally doesn't count, but it does. I mean, to, you know, to them live in the city, but you don't, you don't matter. You're not, I'm glad that you're there Staten Island because you, people need a place to live. Um, where, 
Oh, bars. Oh, yeah, but that's, oh, yeah, that's right. You can stop anywhere in Manhattan on any street. Make it a cross street. That'll be a little bit easier for this point. And you can probably see four, what am I going to say? Four to five bars and or restaurants. I'm going to include restaurants in here, but like, let's say, let's say three bars at least. Almost everywhere. In Midtown, yes, you can probably see 12. In Tribeca, things are a little more spread out. It's a little more difficult. But but you can still see a bunch. That's just go with me on this. And they're like little they're like little churches for me. And you I don't even care. You can drink non-alcoholic stuff. I'm not even talking about the booze part of it. I mean, even churches have wine. But it's that's the nice thing. You they're just like little churches because you can go escape the world. You know, you can you're basically a refugee at that point, seeking asylum. You're seeking, you're looking for a place to stay. You're like uh, you're like the poor and the destitute or homeless, whatever that, uh, you know, the church is supposed to open up their doors to temporarily. Like, hey, I just need a place to stay. All right, come on, my child, come in here. That, I, that would be a weird thing for a bartender to say. <laughs> it's like, hello, my child. I would actually, I might be into it for like a minute, you know, just to kind of see where it goes. But I think I would be mostly uncomfortable the entire time. Now, if they had like the whole get up the Cossack and collar, whatever, I can't, I don't know all the, the stole, all the parts of the, the clergy's clothing, uh, then I could, then it would make sense. What if it, oh, if it was just a bar that priests served and like for an additional fee slash obviously donation to the church, they would bless the wine. That would be cool. That's a great idea for a bar. The church should get into that. You know, make it, keep, just have it run out of the side of the, the church. Just have a bar. Have a real bar with decent food. You know, you know, snacky things in case people do get hungry, want a bite to eat. But that'd be kind of fun. And have, you know, priests, have, have nuns serving. That would be great. All the, all the booze is stored in like a giant tabernacle. Come on. This is a great idea. I mean, if you think about it, that's kind of what, church is mass is really just just a tiny it's a it's a giant bar it's a very disproportionately shaped bar because you've got a lot of people and a lot of chairs pews and then one glass of wine for the whole thing that's i think that's inverted i would rather have you know very few people and lots of wine but make it a bar it's just it's just a, a ma- church is just a misshapen disproportionate bar That'd be kind of fun. And, and I, you know, priests are, I, I'm a big, I'm a fan of them. I went to whatever, 16 years of Catholic education, uh, especially the Jesuits. They're, they're super fun to me. They'd make, I think they'd make fun bartenders. Hell, they were hammered most of the time when I was in high school, you know, so that's, they're great. They'd come and see our shows on dress rehearsal or tech nights and they'd be, uh, they'd, they'd be having a good time. So they, you know, so they know how to drink. They know how to serve, obviously. But uh, yeah, I think that'd be super fun. And and they're knowledgeable on things. Like you can chat with them. They're intelligent. They they tend. Now I'm talking about Catholic. Uh, the others, I don't, you know, the other Christian um, priests, I think, I think a lot of them are stupid. You know, like the big mega church ones, they don't strike me as the most intelligent. And, and they, they might be. I'm just saying it, I've never been to one. I've never been to the, one of those giant services. They don't, I don't think they're, they don't strike me as like erudite, you know, learned. Um, they read one book. I mean, I know there's a bunch of books in the big book, but I think that's, that to me is what, is what the other Christian, some of them. I'm not going to, just the mega church. Okay, let's, why don't we just... But yeah, I, I tend to think of Catholic, especially the Jesuit, as like pretty fun, pretty smart, you know, education focused. That and they that the, those make fun drinking buddies, you know, people to chat with. We used to have them over to dinner in college, and it'd be it was fun. You get into fun debates and conversations, if, and then Protestants I think would be fun once you get them drunk, because you know they tend to be a little more tight lipped. I think. I haven't hung out with a whole bunch of Protestant priests, but if they're, like Protestant, if they're anything like Protestant people, then you got to get them going first. Um, yeah, I think. So anyway, yeah, bars run by the church. I, 
I mean, I, I know they're, they're hurting for money and what a better way. I mean, you, you know, rent is free. You're not paying for it. Just run it out of the back. It's call it the rectory. Come on. Is that not a great title for a bar? The rectory? Or my child? That'd be a little weird. But, you know, back to that. But that for a title for the, the, the Catholic bar, you know, the church-run bar. Are there these out there? Am I missing it? Do I? Maybe I'm just the dumb one here. That's very true. That's the whole reason I do this thing. Is to figure out just how stupid I am. But yeah, church-run bars, what are we calling it? We're calling it the rectory. Uh, Nuns and Co. That'd be good. Nuns and Co. I like that name. Uh, G-O-D. Like, could you do something? All right, well, I'll work on that. I'll work on the the title. Man, yeah, this is good. Now the, now the juices are flowing. What about... Uh, what is it? Uh, transmogrification? No, transfiguration? No, trans. Oh, call it transubstantiation. Where are you guys going tonight? Oh, down to the trans place. Transubstantiation. Wouldn't that be a great title? Because then you never know. Like, is it really Jesus that I'm drinking here? Yeah. Oh, this is great. Call it bread alone. You know, you could go, there's so many things you could pull from the, just call it the Gospels. Man, I think that'd be fun. You know, but it wouldn't be like overtly, I guess it would have to be somewhat overtly Jesus, but you know, like churchish. But you know, maybe it could be kind of kitschy church, you know? Call it sacrilege. Oh, that'd be fun. Or blasphemy. These are fun. These are fun ideas because it's like a little bit sinner, a little bit saint, you know, sinners and saints would be a great title for I, these might all exist. So you might be rolling your eyes more than usual at some of these titles. Yeah, Sinners and Saints. I kind of like that. This would be, I'm, I'm, I think I'm onto something. Don't, if you've ever said, I think I'm onto something, you shouldn't have said that. And I just did. So, I like that. I like this, uh, the church run bar. Okay, so anyway, but yeah, that's one reason I'm very excited about things, right? I'm so happy. That was the thumb reason I'm so happy when I was counting on my thumb and index finger. This is the thumb one, the bar one. Thumbs up, baby. Bars are back. It's just so nice. Before you, any, oh, before or after a meeting, you know, I, uh, actually, there's three reasons now. I'm still counting with my thumb. I'll do three like this with my fingers, the real fingers. There's three reasons I'm happy. Let me pause now for station identification, and then we'll get right back to this. Okay. So yeah, three reasons. Super excited. That was reason number one. Oh, number two is the halal guy remembered me. Isn't that great? I haven't seen this guy for, I haven't seen this guy for how long? Since February. Because I, I haven't had like a lamb euro since February 2020. So it's been whatever, 14, 13 months and he remembered me. I, I was, I was blown away. Actually, this was, this was last night. Laura and I had gone to his, another bar to chat and kind of just collect ourselves, talk about work and, and play, you know, work and play. And, uh, I don't even know what that, who says work and play. Does anybody actually say that work and is anyway, forget I said that just Anthony edit, edit this out when you're done. But yeah, we had gone there for a couple of drinks and we had nachos. It was fine. And then when we got home, we're like, you know what? We could use a little more food. You know what? Halal. Because there's a guy on our corner. And I go there and I order the two lamb euros. And then I, I said uh, one with lettuce and tomato, one with lettuce. And then he's like white sauce on both, red sauce or hot sauce on the one with tomatoes. And I was like, yes. And he's like, I remember you. And I was like, I remember you too. And that was it. That was it. But no, no, that's, I'm so excited for that because it's, it feels like that's, it's just these little kind of details that are like, oh yeah, it's coming back. You know, it, it feels, it feels like things are getting back to normal, you know, some changes or whatever. But he was the guy who taught me how to say thank you in Arabic. 
and how to say asshole in Arabic. Um, cause he, he would say, you know, something and I'd say, what's that mean? And he would, he, then he did, he translated and, uh, turned out to be, thank you, asshole. Um, but you know, that is, you know, it was just great to see him. He remembered the order and everything, which is interesting. Cause what that either means, that means that there's either not that many people, not either. There's three options here, I guess. That means there's maybe not that many people that go see him, but I don't think that's true. Cause I always see people there. It could mean that, uh, well, this is my wife was saying, Lauren was saying, well, maybe you're just the only guy that's nice to him, you know, that says thanks. And cause I do see a lot of people there who are just grumbling and like, give me chicken over rice. And then they just walk away. I mean, they pay and they, they come back for their food and then they, then they leave. But you know, they grumble and like, what? just smile. It'd be, you know, thanks for the guys making the food right there in front of you to order. But anyway, that was her hypothesis that maybe I was the only guy that's actually nice to him. Cause I would sit and chit chat with him. You know, there's a whole line for me behind me. And that's why he would say like, oh, thanks. That's all I am. Get out of the way. You're blocking all these other people. I, I don't know if I believe either of those things. What I would hope to believe is that I just have a face that's so handsome that this guy was like, I could never forget that face. And I think I tend to believe that one. I think that's true. Or the, maybe I guess another option is that I'm the only one that orders two lamb euros, lettuce and tomato on one, lettuce on the other, white sauce on both, hot sauce on the one with tomato. Maybe that's the other case. So there's maybe four options. I, there, there, I guess, okay, four options. That's fine. But anyway, the whole point is things are coming back. He recognized me. I'm excited about that. But that's like, that's part of when you live in a giant city full of millions and millions of people, you, it's almost easier to create a sense of community because then you, you have to, in order to get by, like you, you, you then like focus hyper locally. Like, well, I know, I know the bartenders across the street. I know them well. I know the owner of the restaurant, you know, and and it's nice because you just, it's nice seeing the same faces every once in a while, as opposed to the millions of other weirdos out there all the time. And then the halal guy on the corner, you know, you see the same people and it's like, okay, let's, it's, <laughs> it's almost like when you're in a foreign country and you hear somebody speaking your language and you like lock eyes and you're like, all right, that's kind of the feeling you have in New York is that sense of community. Like you need, it's nice to see a friendly face in a foreign land. And in, and in this case, he was the only guy that doesn't speak English. Really? He does, but not, you know, it's not his first language. And, uh, I like that. Yeah. So anyway, it's like, it's a sense of community and, and we, I, it was hard to keep that here because, you know, everybody was dying for a while and then and then, and then they got sick and they didn't die for a while. And then everybody's scared to see anybody so that no one got sick and no one died for a while. And now everybody's just doing everything with everyone else. That's so nice. Things are coming back. This is just a short little interlude, a little palate cleanser with some halal in there. But yeah, it's, just, it's nice knowing that that guy's back. He remembered me. I remembered him. Oh, man. But yeah, things are coming back. I went to go see. I've been seeing a lot more live comedy lately since there are shows happening and some has been good and some has been bad and that's that's the good and the bad about live comedy and i wouldn't say that the good is always good and never bad and the bad is always bad and never good because sometimes you can see bad comedy that you have that makes you laugh for instance one show i was at it was a bar show with a but they had a separate kind of room for comedy like a little stage they had a little crate built up and there were some funny comedians and some um, not so funny comedians, you know, which happens. And uh, there, uh, and there were also f comedians who were very funny that I've seen before who were not funny that night, and that happens too sometimes. And you should be prepared for that. The what I wasn't expecting. Okay, so that's that's the good part of comedy. I think the variability is kind of fun sometimes. And when you see good people bomb, that's it can be funny, and I'll explain that in a second. And well, obviously when you see them do well, that's great. And even when you see bad comics, you know, when they bomb, it can be funny. It can be great, which again, I'll explain. Uh, but then you can also go on the flip side and you can see really good folks and, and it's not a great experience. And here's why 
uh, one person got up and did some comedy and I've seen this gal a lot. She's hilarious. But uh, when she, on this particular set, she treated it kind of like an open mic in the sense that she came up with paper and it wasn't a good show. There were people who paid money to go see this show and she treated it like an open mic. Now for the non comics out there, when I say open mic, open mics are terrible. Okay. This is, this is, it's like going to the gym to watch somebody do a very poor job of working out. That's what every open mic is like. And for good reason, right? Cause comics need a place that's like a safe space where we can just be free to be as terrible as we want. And sometimes we need that you know, to work out a joke, something's not working. I need to go speak it in front of other people. And open mics are, are good for that when you need some, just, just to, you know, put in a few reps kind of a thing. So that's what an open mic is. Um, I would, by the way, if you're not a comedian, don't pay money to go see an open mic unless you want, it, it really is like seeing it's going, it's like paying money to watch somebody work out in a gym. And it's not like in the Equinox gym. It's like in the 24 hour fitness or planet fitness style gym where people are just haggard. They're tired They're but they're still putting in reps. You know, that's it's So it's not like the sexy version where everybody's in Lululemon workout pants and, uh, fit. It is, there are, most people are unfit. In, in the comedic sense. And that's, that's why we go there is to, is to get better and work things out anyway. So don't pay money to go see an open mic unless you want to, unless you're into that, which is okay, that's fine. But I would also suggest that comedians don't treat real shows like open mics. Now in the grand scheme of things, this is not like an A room. It, you know, it's not like a theater. It's, it's not even maybe a B room because it is a bar show. There's, it's a little bit more flexible, a little more relaxed, but I would suggest, I actually here, I would, I'm going to propose that the people in the audience don't see it that way. They don't know that they're in a casual bar show. You know, they want, they want to go see a show. Not in like the Broadway or, or uh, Beacon theater kind of show kind of way, but you know, they pay money. You pay money, you want to see something funny. And and to see somebody go up there with a piece of paper, like, okay, I'm gonna try out some new stuff. I'm just working on some things. I I don't I don't think that's fair. Uh I don't think it or I I would rather give the the people who pay money come see a show. I'd rather give them a good show. Let's work on this let's work on the stuff I'm relatively comfortable in. Or let's give them the stuff I'm relatively confident in. Give them a good show. Make them laugh. That's our job. Our job is not to work out in front of an audience. Our job is to give an audience a good show. And this person just, and there weren't, now it would, it actually would have been okay. Cause some comedians do this where it can become part of their, like work their act in a casual show to use a piece of paper. I've seen Jim Gaffigan get up and work out material at Gotham comedy club. And when he's working out new stuff and he wants to take, and he wants to remember the new jokes he's working on, he'll reach into his pocket He'll reach into his pocket, pull out a note and say, oh, these are just notes from Jesus. And then he puts it away. And because he's reminded himself what he wants to talk about next. And then he does it. And it's funny because he uses that moment to remind himself what he wants, but he also makes a joke about it. And the, this comedian and other comedians I've seen do this, they just pull out a piece of paper and then they all, it's almost like they're reading off of it and there's no punchline. There's no joke there. And maybe you can do that once or give us one of those as an audience member, like, okay, fine. But uh, I, it, it, what it does, I think is burns the room for the rest of the comics afterwards. So keep that in mind because you're acting, it's a very selfish move to do that. And I think it's a, it's a kind thing to do to both your audience and your fellow comedians to not destroy the room in the bad way. Cause then there, they're like, okay, is everybody else going to do this? We've seen four comedians before this person. Then she got up and did this piece of paper thing. Oh boy. I thought this was a show, you know, like let's treat it like a show. Okay. And then there's this other guy on the same show who, uh, and I've seen this guy before. He's kind of funny. I mean, in my opinion, he's kind of funny and, uh, actually, well, okay. He's kind of funny, but, um, he, he was not doing well. The audience did not like the material he was putting out there, which happens. Sometimes your material just doesn't gel with an audience and a skilled 
comedian, I think, will be able to pivot a little bit to kind of match the mood of the room or win them back somehow. Most of the time it happens when it's, and this was kind of a corporate ish group in the audience. And some of the other comics had talked like talked about a lot of sex stuff beforehand. And okay. I got cut off there. I had a little technical difficulty with some things, but <clears throat> where was I going with this? Oh yeah. Could you imagine laughing at a sex joke in front of your boss? You know what I mean? And if it was really good, maybe, you know, if it wasn't so good and some of these were like pretty dirty, you know, and it's just, and I tend to be pretty conservative in that sense, in terms of comedy in the show. Like I, my personal preference is towards the cleaner stuff, but that's not it, for a corporate, for corporate things, especially, I just think it's safer anyway. So this guy wasn't doing too well. At one point, he pulled out a piece of paper. Yes, another. This was another comic with a piece of paper. And he said, all right, on this paper in front of me, I have numbered jokes. And then he said, call out a number. And then it was silent for 10 seconds. And to give you an idea of what 10 seconds of silence is like, I'm just going to give you three seconds of silence. Ready? That's uncomfortable. Maybe you're like, thank God this guy shut the heck up. But I think, don't say shut the heck up, Anthony. Say shut the hell up. Just be okay with it. That one's an okay one, I think. All right. But this guy said, throw out a number. It was 10 seconds of silence. And 10 seconds of silence is a long time, especially during a show. And especially after somebody requests information. When the when the comedian says, anybody out there married? And it's just crickets for 10 whole seconds. And this one is even a married thing. This was like a... Throw out a number. The, and the, 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 the thing is, these people just didn't want to play because it's a dumb game, I think. Don't ask to that. If you do it once, f- try it, I think. Give it a shot. Maybe that's part of your shtick. Okay. If they're not biting, change bait. Change your bait. So somebody finally said, number one. And then he told the joke. It wasn't very good. And then... Um, and then, and then it was another sign. Somebody said 69 and he's like, Oh yeah. Okay. There's always one in the crowd. Uh, and then, and then it was another 10 seconds of science. And finally, somebody else said one more thing. He said another joke. And so it was not going well. And he finally, he, he turned, he got mad at the audience and he said, these jokes are so, these jokes are great. They're killer. That's why I do them every night. And that's, I think if you need to tell people that your jokes are funny, that's a joke. That's actually, that might be kind of funny. That's funny when you say that. Uh, incidentally that didn't get a laugh, <laughs> but, but I think the, the funny thing is to me is that he, he finally quit he finally gave up and said, boy, it's not going well tonight. That got a laugh. And then he made another comment like, you know, I've been doing comedy for 30 years and I might quit tonight. Or, you know, I've been doing this for so long tonight might be the night I get out of it. Something like that. That got another laugh. And the, it's funny because those are the biggest laughs of his entire set. And I think, I think that's important for comedians to remember is that if you're tanking, do call it out. Let them know. D- don't do it until it's obvious, though. I think. I think you should sell your jokes. Any joke that you have, you need to sell like you have 100% confidence in it. You need to tell it like it's the funniest thing you've ever written. Because I think the audience will pick up on that. They, they you know... It, you need to still work on your stuff, but if it's not your great material, sell it like it is. And I, because I think there's in like the, there's kind of like a hierarchy of, I think how an audience will laugh. The top hierarchy, the top thing on the list is involuntarily. That's always great. When you say something so funny, a laugh just explodes out of a group. That's funny. That's great. And then the, you know, the next level down is like, it's somewhat voluntary where it's like, Oh, that was, that was pretty good. And you, and you know, you hear a laugh. The next thing down is when a comedian doesn't deliver the funniest joke you've ever heard, but you can tell it's a punchline based on intonation and context. And then, you know, a lot of people will still, they're along for the ride. They know, okay, we got 10 more minutes of this, an hour long of this. This may not be the best joke in the entire world ever written, but I'm going to laugh. Keep this guy going. And I think, and I think they do, they keep paying, they kind of ante up the audience and they know, okay, well, I'll go with this guy. He hasn't lost me yet. So I'll pay him a laugh. And that, that's, you know, it's not the best thing in the world, but it's also not the worst. 
You know, it's not, you know, it keeps you afloat as the comic. You, you, and you can tell, but it's, that's still good that you haven't lost them. But when you, <laughs> when you have lost them, then you can call it out. If, if things, if you're in a rut and uh, you, uh, just, just say it, just make it, make a joke about it. Have a couple in your back pocket. Ideally never get in the situation, but you will. It's just something doesn't gel with the audience. Maybe you're off on that night. Maybe you had a hoagie for lunch and it's just sitting sideways in your stomach and you're, and you, and you can't move. Yeah. Call it out. And that's, and then, then I, then it breaks down the fourth wall a little bit. I think, I mean, I know the fourth wall's already broken. Just be, bear with me for a second here, but I think people will, then you're a human again. You're not this object on stage desperately trying to make people laugh and then getting angry when we're not, then you turn into a human again and they can relate to the human thing. They can, you can, you can create empathy there or you can, you can kind of solicit empathy, sympathy. I don't know. Sympathy, but they can empathize with you because they've had to stand in front of a room at some point in their life and say something. They know how hard it is. So anyway, if you're bombing big time, call it out, get them back. Then that's the way you get them back. And this guy did. Unfortunately, it was right at the end of his set. <laughs> so he had won the audience back. They actually kind of started laughing. And they're like, okay, you know, this guy's trying. He's up here. We're, we're laughing. We know how hard this is. And then it was, thanks for your, uh, you know, uh, that's my time. Thanks for, you know, being a great audience. <laughs> and then he was off. So, <laughs> all right. Ideally, realize it sooner. And don't bring paper up. Um, I don't know. Do people disagree with me out there? I'm willing to listen to this. I'm willing to entertain an argument. Pokecast at gmail.com. P-O-A-T cast at gmail.com. Send me your thoughts, your comments. Cause I mean, it's kind of a, uh, an echo chamber in here sometimes. And I like it like that, but I like it that way. But you know, sometimes it's nice to hear what other people think, especially if they disagree or agree. Let me know. Uh, yeah. So don't bring paper. Oh yeah. But then I also think, I think comedians kind of, it feels like we sometimes use the idea of working on new material in front of an audience as a crutch. And we take that too far. Don't underestimate your ability to, to write a joke that's funny enough to not need a piece of paper in front of an audience. And definitely whatever you do, don't rely, don't have that be, don't make your entire set whipping out a piece of paper and saying, okay, I'm going to try this next one. Hopefully this works. Don't, don't do that. Now, I, okay. I have seen uh, Seinfeld drops. Uh, I, I did see Seinfeld drop in at Gotham comedy club. This is like three years ago when he was refreshing material for his, I think it was the special Jerry before Seinfeld on Netflix. And during those sets, he came up, he, he would, uh, he brought up a little music stand and he'd bring his notebook and he would say, all right, here's here. And he explained the deal. He's like, isn't this great? He, he opened with some funny material and standby classic stuff he's been using for a while. And it's great, I think. And, and then he said, okay, here's the deal. I, Netflix is paying me uh, a dump truck full of cash. And uh, I'm, I need to make sure this material is good for this special. So are you okay if I work on it? And immediately, once you get, once you even ask, and we're always going to say yes to that kind of a thing, then, then we're in on the project. We're with you. We're supporting you. That's a fun way to do it. And, and he wasn't working out new punchlines that were, he, it was already funny. He may have been punching it up on stage, but I still, I think it was just, it was fun because it was already pretty funny. And then he's like, oh, and he used it more as like a reminder of like, okay, here's what I want to talk about next. And he was more, it seemed like dusting off the cobwebs on some of these old jokes. Cause a lot of them, it was Jerry before Seinfeld was the special. So it's all the material he'd written before whatever, 1998, when the show came out. 89, 98, no, 89. I think it came out in 90. I don't know, whatever. I didn't watch it. But anyway, that was the point. And it was, that's an okay way. I think as an audience member, you know, my two cents, that's a great way to do it is have some great material and then say, all right, are you guys all right? If I try some new things here or, or dust off the cobwebs on something, or maybe even don't even tell us whatever, I don't know, do whatever you need to do, but that's a fun way to get us on your side and then we're, then we're rooting for you still. Um, 
Yeah. So anyway, th- I thought that was great. So yeah, I've been seeing a lot of live comedy lately. It's been so great being back in a club, seeing a bunch of idiots go tell jokes. Like that's, that's what we do. That's what we love. I did stand up. I stood up to do stand up for the first time in 13 months last week. And it felt like riding a bike for the first time. No, I don't. It, it wasn't like riding a bike. It's like getting up on a stage and talking to a bunch of people. Uh, you know, I, I, I felt I, I listened to the recording. It was okay. It wasn't, you know, my best ever. Uh, but I, I thought I was a little bit stiff. But other than that, I mean, I had an erection. So, you know, so sue me. I was that. I was just excited. But no, I was, I was just a little bit stiff. I felt like the oil, I, I felt like the tin man up there a little bit where I needed an oil can and nobody brought me one. So, you know, I just had to lube up on my own. And, uh, you know, I told jokes, people laughed. It was okay. I didn't embarrass myself. I didn't burn the room. And for the first time in 13 months, for doing it for the first time in 13 months, I'm okay with that. I'm happy with that. I'm excited to get back up and do more up and, you know, until then it's going to be more Zoom shows. Oh, I am, by the way, if you are in New York, come see me. Um, I'm hosting a show at Gotham Comedy Club on the 24th of May. So uh, it'd be great to see you there, whoever you are. <sighs> what else? Oh, yeah. So anyway, stand up. It's back. It's so nice. It's great to be back. It, there's finally the sense of community again. I mean, there, there always was. But now I'm participating in it, <laughs> which is nice. It's, and I, that's, I think, one thing I've missed and one thing that I'm kind of excited about and now that things are reopening is I can go see these people, you know, make, make new friends, keep the old. It's that's, that's been nice. Um, cause that's kind of why we do this is not, I mean, it's sense of community. It's, you know, we make people happy. It's, it's not a bad business to be in. Anyway, so I'm very excited about that. So we've covered a lot of topics here today. I think I'm going to call it. I think this is it. I think we've come to the end of the road on yet another Pope podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Uh, you can all, you can support this channel by subscribing. The link is in the description. It should be. Uh, you can check out my website at anthonyladon.com. I am now, I'm doing a TikTok experiment to see if I like it. So I'm there on TikTok at official Anthony Ladon. Or is it Anthony Ladon? Anthony Ladon official. One of those two. Throw the word official in and you can start following me there. Again, it's an experiment. I'm off of social media almost entirely, but enough people said, Anthony, you should try doing TikTok. It was my mom. And so I thought, maybe I'll give it a shot. So far, I don't hate it. And here's why. So I guess we're not done with this because I'm going to explain this little thing about TikTok. I don't hate it because I don't have to consume other people's content. I know know you don't have to on Instagram too, but for some reason, TikTok just feels a little less creepy, even though it is. I don't know. It's not run by Facebook. That excites me to know it. It could be worse. I know. I know there's the whole, you know, China where that got everybody bent out of shape, but you know, so far I, I kind of like it. I, I post videos there once a day and it's been fun. It's been fun. So I'm going to keep doing that. It's a nice place to practice material, get it out there, exposed to a new group of people. So yeah, you can follow me there if you want, or don't, if you're not a TikTok person, I don't care. What else is going on? I think that's it. All right. So now we're going to end this thing. Thank you so much for, for listening or watching, whatever you're doing. Um, And we'll be, uh, keep in touch. We'll see you around next week.